Okay, so today's topic is Fourier optics and diffraction. And this will be probably three lectures, maybe, maybe bleed into a fourth. And this is all about how, how waves propagate in three dimensions, not in the two simple situations we've talked about so far, which are plane waves, which have no, no boundary. They're just infinitely large planes of crests and planes of troughs moving, or uh, a cavity. With, with spherical mirrors, where we, we've talked about the modes of that cavity. Uh, here, the idea is you, if you shine light on a uh, yeah, sort of the simplest examples, which we'll actually calculate numerically, is if you shine light on a razor blade, the shadow you get is not a, a perfectly sharp razor blade. It, it has a bunch of ripples from constructive and destructive interference. If you shine laser light through a pinhole of a certain size, you'll get a uh, interesting bullseye pattern, which uh, has to do with the constructive and destructive interference of, of the wave fronts. Or if you shine light through a square aperture, you get kind of an interesting pattern of squares going off in both directions. And uh, that's, that's the sort of diffraction aspect. And this is used a lot in, in terms of uh, thinking, thinking about how imaging systems React to waves that are coming in rather than uh, rather than the the rays that we talked about earlier, and there's all kinds of interesting things you could do, which which I'll I'll hint at as we go along. Um, you can do interesting kind of filtering and signal processing, like high pass filtering and low pass filtering of of images, purely with optics, by setting up the right lenses and the right masks uh, that the light has to go through. You can, at the speed of light, perform these signal processing operations. Uh, and the, the diffraction limit of telescopes and microscopes is an important concept that, that sets, OK, how, how finely can I see in a microscope? How, uh, how well can I separate two, two uh, bright sources that are on at the same time? Uh, in, in a microscope or uh, in the sky. All those things have, have to do with the, the wave properties and the diffraction. And uh, the, there's sort of a, a meta reason for talking about this, which is this is really where a lot of physics students get, get a better handle for Fourier transforms and Fourier manipulation. So I know that I personally got a, a good feel for Fourier transforms for the first time in, in optics and uh, especially the 2D and, and 3D stuff. And it's, it's of course very applicable to a lot of other physics. Uh, super important for momentum space in quantum mechanics and that applies to particle physics and condensed matter physics. A lot of stuff happens in momentum space. And because the momentum of a particle has, has to do with its wavelength, there's a lot of breaking things down into a sum of, of wavelengths and, and because uh, Maxwell's equations and the Schrodinger equation are both linear equations, you can do that. You can break whatever you're starting with down into a bunch of plane waves, do simpler, relatively simpler things on the plane waves, and then sum up the result. And, and because the equations are linear, that works. So um, if at any point in your lives you're ever going to deal with time series, like the, the audio data that, that I gave you for the homework, or image processing, or any sort of uh, or any sort of structured data like that, structured sample data, Fourier techniques are all over the place, and they're super important to to get a handle for. And you know, this, this takes a lot of practice. There's sort of a little bit of intuition you you can build up, and hopefully, after my talk and after you do the the tutorials with the Python, you'll get a little bit more intuition. Um, let me let me start by. You know, eventually we're going to talk about two-dimensional and three-dimensional Fourier transforms. But let me start by just reminding you of the one-dimensional Fourier transform that we talked about last week, but you know, in a way that's sort of more generalizable to what we want. So for, for a Fourier transform in, in time, I'm going to write my, my function g of t. This is just some arbitrary function g of t. I want to write this function as a sum of sum of sines and cosines. I can write it as a sum of sines and cosines if it's a real function. In general, if it's a complex function, 
or even if it is a real function, I, it's often easier to write it as a sum of complex exponentials. So I'm going to write it as a sum of a whole bunch of complex exponentials, each of which are going to be e to the i. I'm going to write it first as 2 pi f, real honest frequency, t. So these are each of the complex exponentials. And I, I need to sum over all possible frequencies. So that's in, when it's continuous, it's an integral from minus infinity to infinity. If it's discrete, um, if you have a finite sample, for example, you, you have these discrete one cycle, two cycles, three cycle frequencies that you'll sum over. But in the sort of infinite continuous case, we're going to integrate over, over the frequency. And each of these complex exponentials gets weighted by some complex number, which we call g tilde. And I'm going to distinguish g tilde as a function of f from g tilde as a function of omega. So remember, f here is a real frequency. So it's 1 over some real time, time you know, the, the time it takes the, the cosine to go through a complete cycle. Um, let me change variables. Well, this is often done. So for whatever reason, people don't like the two pi's up here. And so oftentimes, people change variables to omega, write omega equal 2 pi times the real frequency. And this is an angular frequency in radians per second. And of course, that nicely gets rid of the 2 pi up here. But when you calculate df, the 2 pi ends up over there. So instead of df, I get d omega over 2 pi. And let me just write this as g tilde of omega with no subscript, e to the i omega t. Um, when you do the discrete Fourier transforms, you're thankfully back in the world of real honest frequencies. You don't have to worry about angular frequencies. Um, I would say that written like this, things look much, I don't know, to me, they're more intuitive. Uh, the Fourier transform in its inverse look much more symmetric when written in terms of real frequencies, not angular frequencies. Um, and and the two pi's are kind of like toothpaste. You try to squeeze them out somewhere, and they they end up oozing out somewhere else. So it's not a huge huge advantage. Just people tend to like the two pi's out here as constants rather than up in the exponents or inside of the sines and cosines. Which okay. So uh, this is what we talked about a lot in the last few lectures. This time time transform. And one thing I, I failed to mention, the, I talked about the Fourier transform spec spectrometer where we had a Michelson interferometer and we interfered two copies, two incoming copies of, of the wave. I talked about that as uh, important for, for chemistry and that's certainly true, a lot of the chemists use it. But actually in my own field of cosmic microwave background research, the very first satellite to take a spectrum of the cosmic microwave background and show that it really is thermal Maybe you've seen the XKCD comic with the, the thermal spectrum of the cosmic microwave background with, with the error bars drawn hundreds of times bigger than they actually are, just because otherwise you wouldn't be able to see them. That technique for taking that spectrum was a Fourier transform spectrometer in space. So uh, that worked at microwave frequencies. But it was the exact same technique. It was a Michelson that, that moved, moved, uh, moved a mirror. Uh, over and over and over again, and looked at different parts of the sky and took took spectra by taking the Fourier transform of the interference pattern that it got out. So we're gonna we're gonna leave time stuff behind for a little bit, and and let's talk about spatial spatial Fourier transforms. So so for space, I have a quick question. Yes, um, we're integrating over negative frequencies, right? Ah, yes. So that's 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 excellent. So so if you had sines and cosines, um, negative frequencies don't don't make as much sense. But if you're dealing with complex exponentials, so you can write. Uh, I'll just write write it like this. Let me go back to blue for a second. Yeah. So the negative frequency I say is the other the other conceptual hurdle that uh, that uh, you need to play with a little bit. So so if I have some e to the i uh, 
well, I'll, I'll just write it two pi seven t. So I'm just making up some, some number here. That means that as, as t goes from zero to one, this complex exponential, if I plot it in the complex plane, this goes from zero up an angle and it'll loop around like this seven times. And, uh, and it, it goes in the positive phi direction. And if I were to write this as cosine of two pi times seven hertz, maybe I should give this units, seven hertz times t, this would be plus i sine of two pi times seven hertz times t. And, and what, you know, the cosine component is just the horizontal component. So that cosine of zero starts at one, sine of zero starts at zero. So it's pure positive and real. And as, as time goes on, um, the sine gets a little bit bigger and cosine gets a little bit smaller. And we have, uh, we have something that sort of does this. Here's the cosine and the sine goes like this, maximum zero crossing, minimum zero crossing, maximum. So what is a negative frequency? An, a negative frequency is a coefficient where we don't want to add up a cosine and a positive sign. So we don't want to add up things with, with this phase relationship. We want, we want to add up a, Cosine, so I, write, I think I have room down here. Yeah, e to the minus i, two pi, seven hertz, times time. This is cosine of. So it's still cosine of the thing up here, but since cosine is symmetric, it's still two pi, seven hertz, times t, and sine is anti-symmetric. So sine of negative x is negative sine of x. So this is minus i minus i sine of two pi seven hertz time. Okay, so what does this look like? Well, in this picture, uh, in the complex plane, at t equals zero, the cosine part is one and the sine part is, is still zero. So we start at the same place. It's just that instead of going up and having the the complex exponential spin around this way, the uh, the uh, negative one's going to go down. The complex exponential is going to spin that way. So this is negative, and this blue one is positive. And this is this blue here is cosine, and this red is sine. And I could draw the I could draw a minus sign. It's just the inverse of this red. So. That just has the opposite. Uh, so this is minus sine. It starts off at zero and goes down. Um, okay, so when we have a generic function, we can make it up of sines and cosines, but they can't be sines and cosines that start exactly at the origin. So um, Maybe in other classes when you've done sort of Fourier stuff with sines and cosines, you can either write it as uh, a, a real function as a sum of sines and cosines or as a sum of cosines shifted by some amount. Um, here, if you're writing a complex function, uh, you, you really need totally, you need totally arbitrary coefficients and they need to be different for the positive frequencies and the negative frequencies to make up, to make up an arbitrary g of t. Now, for if your g of t is a real function, and this is something that I sort of go through in the, in the tutorial, in the homework, and g of t is real, then it turns out that in order to make real numbers out of these e to the i 2 pi fts, or real numbers out of this e to the i omega t, um, the, the coefficient of plus plus seven hertz here has to be the complex conjugate of the coefficient of minus seven hertz. And that 
that will have these complex exponentials combine into real sines and cosines with, with some, you know, or a real sinusoid with some offset. And that will, that will be the, the part of this that's going at seven hertz. So if it's a real function, there is, there is some, some sinusoidal thing that's going at, at seven hertz. Um, but it doesn't necessarily start, it's not necessarily a cosine, it's not necessarily a sine, it's some, some sinusoid at seven hertz that starts off with some uh, arbitrary phase. And that phase, in order to get that phase right, that phase is encoded in the phase of this complex number. And in order to turn the positive going complex exponential plus, you know, this is an integral, so you're integrating all overall. So there's one of them is going to hit plus seven, one of them is going to hit minus seven. So this, some coefficient of this plus some coefficient of that, in order to have those combine into real sines and cosines, you need to have the coefficient of plus whatever, plus seven hertz, be equal to the complex conjugate of the coefficient of the minus seven hertz. So um, that's something that I'll actually demonstrate in a little bit. In, in two dimensions, what, what that becomes in two dimensions. Uh, it's sort of plane waves going in this direction versus plane waves going in that direction. So if you, you demand a, well, I, I'll, I'll show you in a little bit um, what, what it means to be, to give, you, to give a real, real function at the end of the day, what, what that imposes on the, on the coefficients again that it's it's that the if at the end of the day you want a real function the coefficients of the uh, coefficients of the negative version of any particular frequency are the complex conjugates of the coefficients of the positive version of that particular frequency and that's that's just to get get the right phase shift and get a real number at the end i don't know did that did that help Yes, no, maybe, okay. Um, All right, yes, yes. That's okay. All right, so, um, I, you know, again, this is sort of, there's probably 10 different little bits of intuition that, that one has to build up. And, and I, uh, I, I, that's, that's not very difficult to prove. In fact, I think I, in the little tutorial, I sort of motivate why why that is by you just have some generic coefficient and you have the negative frequency and you take the complex conjugate of that generic coefficient you can see how they combine into real sines and cosines um, let's let's sort of generalize this to two dimensions and and then i'll show show some examples of, of two-dimensional Fourier transforms so in time we have this you know hertz one over an actual time in in space, we have what's called a spatial frequency. So we have u, which is one over some length scale in the x direction. That's a spatial frequency. And v, which is one over some length scale in the y direction. Those would be like if you had, as a function of x, you had a sine wave that, that had some, uh, I guess I drew a cosine, that had some wavelength scale wavelength lx, then the spatial frequency of this would be one over that uh, that wavelength, or at least the x the x variation of that wavelength. So, uh, yeah. So if we were to write uh, a generic function f of x and y, now we're dealing with space. And I'll start with two D. The equivalent of this would be some integral from minus infinity to infinity over all of the u spatial frequencies, some integral from minus infinity to infinity over all of the, the v spatial frequencies, the spatial frequencies in the y direction, and uh, some weight. So I'll call this f tilde uv of u comma v e to the i two pi u x plus i two pi v y. 
And again, we have a generic plane wave. So this is, this looks like that, uh, if I were to plot that with the rainbow coloring, it would be some, some plane wave. So now I'll, in the x, x, y plane, there would be some plane wave going off at some direction. And the u is asking, how often does this plane wave repeat if I just consider moving in the x direction? So here, the spatial frequency in u is pretty low, right? Here's a peak, I have to go a ways. Here's a peak, I have to go a ways. Here's a peak. The spatial frequency in the y direction, v, is a little bit higher. So here's a peak, here's a peak, here's a peak, here's a peak. So um, you, know, you can think of these as, as u and v as uh, generalizations of f. And then oftentimes in, in physics, for the same reason why we use angular frequencies, we use angular spatial frequencies. And those are, those are letting, uh, letting kx equal 2 pi u and ky equal 2 pi v. So these are the, the radians per second of the sine wave going by in the x direction versus the radians per second of a sine wave going by in the y direction. And I can write that as integral from minus infinity to infinity dkx over 2 pi, integral from minus infinity to infinity, dky over 2 pi. And here I'll just call it f tilde with no subscripts. kx, ky, e to the i kx x plus i ky y. And if I were to plot kx and ky as a vector, it would be perpendicular to this, this, uh, this the kind of wave fronts. And if I were to turn k around, the wave fronts would, would turn with, with k. And if I were to make k longer, there would be higher frequencies. If I were to make k longer, the, the wavelengths would all bunch up. If I were to make k shorter, the wavelengths would all spread out because the lower the lower frequency. This is k, k as a two-dimensional vector. Um, and this is this is the two-dimensional Fourier transform. This is actually the what we usually call the inverse Fourier transform. It's if I have all of the spatial frequencies, I or right, I have all of the coefficients for every possible spatial frequency. So I have plane waves that are like this, and plane waves that are like that, and plane waves that are like this, but higher frequency or like this but lower frequency. If I knew the complex coefficients of all of those plane waves, I could synthesize a signal by adding up the plane waves with the right set of coefficients. And then the, the two pi's are, you know, have squeezed out of the exponent and ended up here just for bookkeeping purposes. Um, this is usually the inverse Fourier transform. What we call the forward Fourier transform is, is the kind of the analysis. If I if I have a function f of x and y, and I want the, the coefficients of each of the plane waves. So this is sort of something you do in quantum all the time. You have, you have a, a wave function, or you have a, uh, a generic psi, and you want to ask what is the coefficient uh, if I were to write that psi as a superposition of a bunch of stuff, I wanted to pluck out the coefficient of one of those, one of those things, um, you would multiply by the, the bra version of that, which would be the complex conjugate of the function in position space. So let me sort of take all that in words and write it in, in, the, in an equation here. So this is, this is the inverse inverse Fourier transform. And the forward Fourier transform would be if I wanted to find f tilde of kx and ky, and I had f of x and y. So, so for that, there's an integral over all of x, integral over all of y. And uh, I take my function and I, inner product it with the, 
complex conjugate version of the basis function. So e to the minus i kx x minus i k k sub y phi. And this is the forward forward Fourier transform. Okay, so these these look very similar and they are very similar, except for the fact that we you know are annoyingly the way I've written them, I've I've put the two pies here instead of in the exponential in the exponent where they where they really belong. Um, if I put if I put them up in the exponent where they really belong, uh, this would look perfectly symmetric. Uh, and the only thing that would be different would be the complex conjugate. And so often your intuitions you have about Fourier transforms in the forward direction are going to carry right over to Fourier transforms in the inverse direction. It's just a matter of bookkeeping to keep track of the complex conjugates here. And also, depending on whether you use real spatial frequencies, u and v, or the sort of uh, angular spatial frequencies, kx and ky, keep track of the two pi's. Um, in, in Python, it, when you ask what are the, what are the frequencies of, of the signal, it gives you the real honest to God cycles per second u and v. So that's what I, I'm going to show you something now. So let me share, let me share my screen. This is an applet, a Java applet that I wrote in from the dates of the files. It appears to be around the year 2000 when I was your age, basically. Now you know how old I am. Uh, and this this was something that uh, I I did to teach me Fourier transforms. So let me show you what this does. So can can all of you see this applet? And does it take up sort of a reasonable amount of your screens? Okay, good. So um, let me just clear this. So on on the left here we have data. This is like an x y function. On the right we have the Fourier transform of that function. And you can draw on either one, and it will automatically com compute. So if you draw here, it'll compute the Fourier transform. If you draw here, it'll compute the inverse Fourier transform. Uh, so let me draw a single real point of very tiny size somewhere over there. So you, can you see that red, red dot? And there's a little zoom in triangle. So because there's so little, I have to crank up the brightness by quite, quite a lot. Oops. So, so the origin is, is in the center here. And this red dot is kind of off, off over here. And what you can do is you can drag around, drag around the, the image. So let me just drag this red dot around a little bit. And you can see I have a single coefficient of a single complex exponential. And so if it's a little bit positive, I get a plane wave that's going up. If it's a little bit negative, I get a plane wave that's going down. And if it's to the right, I get a planar that's going to the right. And as I make, the, as I drag this to higher and higher spatial frequency, higher and higher u, the plane wave gets more and more and more, uh, the stripes get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so if I drag it all the way to the very edge, the highest spatial frequency I can have, if I go over here and look at it, highest spatial frequency I can have is pretty much uh, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. I haven't quite dragged it to be perfectly, uh, perfectly horizontal, but the highest frequency is a plane wave that's, you know, its peaks and troughs are every pixel. Let me drag it back to the origin here. As I drag it back to the origin, the frequency gets lower and lower and lower and lower. And eventually, if I'm right on the origin, I should have exactly zero. There we go. So zero frequency just means a constant. And if I drag it one pixel up, there we go. This one pixel up, the, the plane wave goes to exactly one cycle. Now, there's various things I could do here. I could look at, right now I'm displaying it like, like we display it with the magnitude and the phase. I can display only the magnitude. That's not very interesting because the magnitude of a complex exponential is always just one. Um, I can display just the phase. So that'll get rid of any magnitude information. I could display just the real part where you see uh, positive 
positive and negative real values, or I can display just the imaginary part. So this is a cosine because it's peaking at, at the origin and it's going low, 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 all the way to negative here. Um, and this is a sign because at the origin, it starts off as zero. And as I go uh, in one direction, it, it gets, oops, I accidentally dragged. As I go in one direction, it gets, uh, gets positive and negative. So um, let me clear this again, and let me show you some other things you can, you can do. So you can click this. This is a Gaussian. I have to readjust this. Uh, oh, maybe not. Never mind. Uh, try the square. Oh, it's because I, I was looking at the imaginary part of a real number. That's why I wasn't there. OK. So the Fourier transform of a Gaussian of a big Gaussian is a small Gaussian. Fourier transform of a circle is this kind of bullseye pattern. Fourier transform of a square is this pattern. Um, if you remember my brief discussion on diffraction, uh, we will eventually see that diffraction has to, a lot to do with Fourier transforms. But for a while, let me just focus on properties of the Fourier transform itself. So for that, we can load certain images. If I load this image of bricks, um, the image is all real. So that's why it's all, all red here, positive real number. Um, I can look at just the magnitude and get a nice grayscale image. Uh, but you see there's some repeating patterns in the bricks, right? I, I go up and there's these dark stripes every so often. And that corresponds with these bright, bright dots as I go up. It's the, the square wave and its harmonics that make up this, this pattern. And the same thing as I go left to right, there's some pattern. It's a little bit more complicated left to right. So therefore the left and right pattern is, is a little bit more complicated. Um, let me show you, uh, this, is, this is Fourier himself. If I have the image of Fourier and, uh, and his, his transform, um, almost all these images have a lot of components around the origin, uh, just because there's a lot of very slowly varying things in an image. Let me zoom in on Fourier's coat here. So uh, you see, Fourier's coat has, has stripes. And if I were to look at these stripes, kind of the, the dominant, dominant pattern of stripes, they're pretty, pretty fine. But the pattern of stripes mostly seems to be going peak trough, peak trough, peak trough, kind of in this direction. And that's why there's a lot of power up here at these high frequencies going at this diagonal. And one thing I could do here is I can actually just delete by drawing a giant square of zeros I can just delete stuff up here. Um, and uh, let me just say, let me comment on the real and imaginary stuff for a second. Because this image is, is purely real, if I look at it in, in magnitude and phase, it's all positive and real. The Fourier transform is symmetric. Any coefficient that I pick out up here, if I were to find its corresponding mirrored version, so like this one versus this one, or this one versus this one. If I were to define the mirrored version of any of these coefficients, they would be complex conjugates of each other. So that when I were to add up all the, the plane waves corresponding to all these different coefficients, um, I would end up with a real image. So I'll, I'll show you that in a second. So let me, let me do two things. Let me erase, erase the stripes by erasing the, the pattern here. And I kind of want to erase the stripes here too. Um, and now you can see that the predominant stripes are no longer going in this direction. They're sort of going more horizontal. And that corresponds to these kind of blobs here. So let me just erase those. And now there's a little bit weaker stripes and they're sort of going, the peaks and troughs happen when I, when I go vertically. And that's sort of these here, I can erase those. And now I've sort of blurred out most of the most of the sort of obvious high frequency stripey stuff, and uh, I've left with a blurrier image. Um, let me go back to let me go back to uh, maybe this picture of Fourier. So one thing I said was that 
this image was purely real. And what, what that means is that this image everywhere, oh, well, let's, um, let me see. Uh, okay. So let me show you how, what low and high frequencies look like. So for an image, I can do what I did before where I kind of zero out, let me make the thing a little bit bigger. I can zero out a lot of the high frequencies. And as you're watching Fourier's image, as I'm zeroing out the higher, higher frequencies, it's getting blurrier and blurrier and blurrier. So if an image is made up of a bunch of, uh, only a bunch of low frequencies, uh, it, it looks a lot blurrier. Uh, let me do the opposite. Let me load Fourier again. And let me zero out just a little bit of stuff right in the center. So zeroing out a little bit of stuff right in the center, uh, this is a high pass filter. So there are no really slow variations anymore. It's sort of finding the edges and enhancing the edges. So as I move, as I move, I see mostly uh, mostly patterns that are kind of symmetric around around zero. Um, let me see. The other thing I want to do is look at Mr. Fourier. And let's ask, when I take the Fourier transform, there's a lot you can learn from the real part, the imaginary part, and the magnitude and the phase. And so it's a, it's a little bit, you know, you can sort of see that the, the pixels here and the little zoom in thing are all kind of randomly colored. So there's a lot of phase, phase information here. If I were to just look at the magnitude of the Fourier transform uh, by only displaying the magnitude as black and white, there seems to be a little bit less information. If I were to display only the phase, setting all the magnitudes to one, it, you can see there's a lot of stuff going on here. If I were to display only the real parts or only the imaginary parts, it's maybe less, less interesting here for now. Let's. Let's ask what happens if, uh, so here I'm displaying the magnitude and the phase, so the pixels are different brightness and they're colored. Let's ask what happens if I start discarding information. So let's see, let's see what's, what's important. So if I were to discard the phase information and only keep the magnitude information, uh, let me do that. So the magnitude information is exactly the same. So if I, if I were to go back to here, and only look at the magnitude is exactly the same. But with all the phase information gone, the peaks in the troughs don't know, don't know where to line up. And in fact, all the, all the peaks line up right at the origin. The origin is super bright because I've taken all the shifts of all the sines and cosines and I've set them all to zero. Well, I, I should say I've turned, I've turned off all of the signs and I made all the cosines positive and they all start at the origin. So clearly, in terms of information, there's a lot of information in the phase. Uh, let's ask what happens if I discard the magnitude and only keep the phase. So here, the Fourier transform just totally looks uh, random. It's because it set all of the coefficients to all of, of all of the complex exponentials to one. But you could sort of still make out roughly that this is a old timey picture of someone Right, so the phase information, in some senses, is more important than the magnitude information. It says where, where all the peaks should line up to make bright features, and where all the troughs should cancel to make dark, dark spots like that. Um, let's ask about the real and the imaginary component. So I said that if this image is real, which it is, it starts off as all real. And let me just show, show, show it to you as a real, a real image, so all red. Um, this, this Fourier transform uh, and its complex conjugate are, are uh, or, sorry, the, the symmetric points are complex conjugates. So that's, that would apply in the opposite way too. If I take all of the, all of this complex information and I discard the imaginary component, I only keep the real component. What happens is now on the, on this side, let me just show the black and white version. Adjust the brightness. On this side, it has done the same thing. It has turned every point symmetric, left and right. And uh, well, it's a mirror symmetric. So 
every every point anywhere is is mirrored across the across the image. So if you have a purely real Fourier transform, so here it's all red and blue, uh, red and cyan, I guess, uh, then, then the image is symmetric in this way. Let me load Fourier again. Let me discard the real information and keep only the imaginary information. So now there, there's also this mirror happening. But uh, if I look at the signs, the a purely imaginary, uh, purely imaginary coefficients look like sines as opposed to cosines, and sines have are uh, anti-symmetric. So instead of instead of having the same sign in in mirror in the mirror flips, we get opposite signs. So his hair is cyan up here, and it's red down here. So uh, those those things. You know, high pass filtering, low pass filtering, discarding various components. Those things are things you're going to play with, but in in Python, as part of your your homework. Um, so you're not going to get to draw and see it happen in real time, but you'll be able to make various computational things and have Python compute the opposite thing and then plot it. So uh, you know, getting a handle for those. I don't know. I probably went through between five and ten ten things to play with. Uh, You'll, you'll do all that in your assignment. All right, sharing the screen. And that is it for today. Next time, we're going to talk about how this Fourier transform stuff applies to Maxwell's equations.